Hello and welcome to Revelation class. We are on chapter 13. So last week we completed chapter 12, the woman, the child and the dragon last week. Tonight we are going to study the beast from the sea. It is going to be very interesting. This is going to be a little lengthy session. Uh, we probably might split the chapter 13 into two. So this is going to be chapter 13 part one, the beast from the sea. So the book of Revelation is laid out into three major sections, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. So we saw that uh, the seal judgments started in chapter 6 and then it is going to the bowl judgments are going to end in chapter 16. So we uh, completed the seven seals. We also studied the seven trumpets. But tonight we are going to study the two beasts that's coming one out of the sea and next week we are going to study the other beast coming out of the earth. So these material are overlapping with all of the things that we have already studied. So when we say the seventh trumpet is blown that means if everything has come to an end because there is celebration, there is everything done but still we have some material to cover. Where does this fit in? So the seven bowls and all the material that we are studying now will actually um, fit into what we have already studied. So this is kind of like, you know, the timeline wise, it is very hard to define because what John saw, he is writing, but timeline wise, it is not a sequence of events. So some of the things that we are studying, some of them are like, like last week, we studied about the characters like the woman, the, the child, the dragon. So where does that fit in? So that is just the giving up the character, describing the characters in the whole story. So it is not talking about a particular timeline, what we studied last week and same thing goes with the beast. Tonight we are going to study the beast. So what this beast represents and things like that. So the other uh, chart I showed you is when it is stretched out, this is how it looks like. So it makes more sense now because um, this will show that as if we are still studying the seventh seal and also this will show that as if we are still studying the seventh trumpet of course although we are completed but the material fits into that same timeline when it is stretched out. So no, no matter how you look at it we are only studying seven year period. So remember the Daniel 70th week, 70th week is the seven year period that is the tribulation and the second half is the great tribulation. So that is what we are going to look at here. So now in last week, chapter 12, session 21, if you have not watched this, please go back and watch this um, session 21. And tonight we are going to study chapter 13. And that in chapter 13, we are going to see the, the beast coming out of the sea. And the next week we'll be studying part B or part 2 of chapter 13, Beast coming out of the earth. Before I go there, I want to introduce to some things so that we, we, we will, it will be more clear when we study the rest of the chapter. So Holy Trinity, when we talk about Holy Trinity, we all understand God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we are all clear on this. But when we get to the book of Revelation, we have an unholy trinity. So I just want to focus on that unholy trinity that makes us to understand. Last week we studied about the dragon and the dragon is the Satan, the liar. The We studied about all the characteristics of Satan, the dragon last week in chapter 12. So the beast from the sea, that is what we are going to study the chapter 13 is representing Antichrist. And then the beast from the earth, chapter 13, again, that is next week, we are going to study that false prophet. So if you look at this combination here, the dragon, the beast from the sea, that's Antichrist, and the beast from the earth, that's the false prophet, these three form an unholy trinity. Look at that. So you have a holy trinity and Satan is having an unholy trinity, with his, which is Satan, the dragon, the beast from the sea, the Antichrist, the beast from the earth, the false prophet. The beast and the false prophet. You might be wondering, where did you get that, John? So it's, we thought only it's Antichrist. Where is the false prophet coming and where are these two additional characters coming? So let's look at this verse. 
So in Revelation chapter 19, of course, I'm jumping again here. As I said, I have to bring in some verses so that I can fill in the gaps. In Revelation 19, verse 20, it says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, so you underline this word, these two, that is the Antichrist, that's the beast from the sea, and the false prophet, that's the beast from the earth. So these two are cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So then there is an another time Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. So we have Satan at one time thrown into the lake of fire. And now here in this particular verse, we clearly see the beast, which represents the, the Antichrist. With him, the false prophet, his sidekick, uh, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone so this is uh, this makes very clear that what we are studying so the unholy trinity is the dragon and so the antichrist and the false prophet so we are going to study in greater detail about this particular verse when we get to chapter 19 the my only point here is there are two characters here so which was also detail mentioned about the beast and the false prophet in chapter 19 so that's why i wanted to show uh, what we have here Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and on his te uh, horns ten crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name. So most of your Bibles say this like then I stood on the sand of the sea. But there are manuscripts which are reliable manuscripts which actually say something different so i just want to this is no big deal but i just want to make it a point here since we are studying this in detail so some some of the actual transcripts should have said then he stood on the sand of the sea so when we say who is that he stood on the sand of the sea instead of i if we say i that is john the apostle and then the second part is, and I saw the beast rising up out of the sea. That is clearly John the Apostle. But the first part, it should have been he based on some um, uh, reliable manuscripts. So I want to highlight another point is when the Bible is written, when the autographs were written, there are no chapters and verses. It is all one passage. It is all written um, in a one single passage in the manuscripts. The chapters and the verses, the divisions came around 1500s, around the 1400s and 1500s. They started introducing these chapters and verses so that it is very easy for us now to go to a particular verse rather than, you know, looking for the whole passage. So it was introduced in 1500s. But there are some places where the chapter divisions were not done properly, but that is no big deal. Uh, still, we can we know how to read the Bible if we want to uh, connect two chapters together or whatever. So here, when we look at uh, this ch chapter 12, verse 17, this is the last ta last chapter that we studied. And here it ends like this in chapter 12. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he, that is who, the dragon, went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Christ, and then it could have continued like this. Then he stood on the sand of the sea. So this is how it should have end, ended uh, in chapter 12, but this part, the last line, then he stood on the sand of the sea was taken to chapter 13. Because of that, now they uh, marked it as I, so referring it to John here. So then I stood on the sand of the sea. So technically, either way you can take it, but I just wanted to point that out. So here Satan stood on the sand of the sea, but then John saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So just a technical point there. So now let's look at the next. Here is the picture of uh, the, the beast that was described. So look at this picture. So the picture is basically it is coming out of the sea. Sea always represents people, groups, nations, tongues, languages. That's what the sea represents in the Bible. 
so it's coming out of the sea and it is like a leopard but it's it's a feet is like a bear's feet and then its mouth is like lions so remember leopard bear and lion these three characters we studied earlier when we studied the book of daniel most of you attended my daniel uh, classes so but now john is writing it in a back order so he is now going backwards when daniel wrote he is writing from the lion which is babylon and then bear the medo persian the greece and the, that is the leopard but now when john writes he is writing it backward so because in, from john's point those um, uh, empires have already passed so verse 2 chapter 13 verse 2 now the beast which i saw was like a leopard his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion so did you notice the order so it started with a leopard bear and lion going backward because now john is in the fourth empire or the fourth beast so to speak that's rome so from rome's point from john's view he is looking backward showing leopard the previous one the greece and then the the previous to that is the medo persian that's a bear and before that was a lion that's the uh, babylon so the dragon gave him his power who is giving the power to this beast satan is giving the power to this beast so the beast that's coming out of the sea looks like this um described as above but satan is giving his power his throne and great authority so you what you need to understand here is satan is invisible right and here he is a the beast is coming out is a physical person and uh, the satan is giving a lot of power to this guy this beast and sometimes you can call this beast as a kingdom because if you remember the four beasts the lion the bear the leopard those are all beasts we call them but yet as those are the empires but for all those empires there were rulers for those empires similarly when we talk about the beast here you could also call it as an empire also you can call a particular individual who is ruling that empire so in that sense satan gave him his power his throne and his authority and now how do we identify this beast that is the that's the big question what we are tackling tonight it is very difficult to deal with this particular uh, uh, question here how do we identify this beast because john gave a lot of description but how do we uh, identify what this beast exactly is Uh, so that is what we are trying to do some people sometimes say the antichrist is the rome um, the pope uh, and things like that so how do we identify the beast we are going to look at some signatures so when we look at it's like a, uh, if you are an fbi you know solving a case so you look for all the clues you look for all everything so that is what we are trying to see and then we are going to piece everything together to try to understand Uh, uh, what this beast is so for us to understand before we understand this beast i just want to give you a brief overview the 70 weeks prophecy we studied this in the book of daniel when we studied if you want a detailed explanation about all these details please watch the daniel series so but here we have 69 weeks after 69 weeks messiah that is jesus christ was crucified but daniel had this 70 weeks prophecy what happened to the 70th week 70th week was yet to be fulfilled in between 69 and the 70th week there is a pause and during this pause we are in the church age now so this prophecy the 70 weeks prophecy was given to daniel and to his people clearly it was said to your people so it is about daniel's people that is the jewish people so if 69 weeks are for the jewish people the 70th week is also for the jewish people in between sandwiched is the pause which is the church we are in right now so after the rapture of course that's when the tribulation begins and that's when the, the 70th week begins and that is what i just want to show you and if you look in the chart the, under the 70th week i wrote the book of revelation so the book of revelation pretty much covers the 70th week 
except for the few chapters that we studied about the church, churches, first two, three chapters. And now here, going back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, it says, And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So, Messiah would be killed, but not for himself. Daniel predicted very precisely that, uh, that Jesus Christ is going to die, but he is not dying for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. In AD 70, the um, city was destroyed and the sanctuary, but who, who destroyed that? So, that is Rome. So, what it is saying here is the people of the prince who, you, who is to come, that is the Antichrist who is going to come, his people is going to destroy the city. So now what does this tell us is, so the Antichrist is going to come of Roman Empire, not just Rome, come out of the Roman Empire. That's what it is going to tell. So this particular verse is where everybody puts their weight on saying, oh, it must be Rome, it must be Pope, it must things like that, because it clearly says, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. And everybody knew who destroyed the city and the sanctuary, that is, the Roman Empire and now people say yeah just because of this particular verse everybody put their uh, hats on this particular uh, Rome. So I just want to uh, uh, point this out the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary we are going to study in detail and in verse 27 it says he that is the Antichrist the prince who is going to come he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Wherever you see the word many, especially in the Jewish writings, especially in the book of Revelation and Daniel, it refers to the Jewish people. It says many, but it's referring to the Jewish people. So here, he, referring to the Antichrist, referring to the prince that we studied in previous verse, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And one week is what? Seven years. So he is going to make a covenant for seven years. At the beginning of this tribulation, this Antichrist will come and make a covenant with the Jewish people, probably with other nations as well, but mainly with the Jewish people. And they trust him. That's why remember Jesus said, I came in my father's name, but you did not receive me. But the one who is going to come in his own name, you are going to receive him. So referring to this person. So when he comes in his own name, Jewish people welcomes him and made a covenant with him and probably he will let them build the temple at that time. But remember here what happens. But in the middle of the week, middle of that seven year period, that is three and a half year period, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. So that means the temple will be ready and by the time they started worshipping and offering sacrifices, he will end everything and then he's going to put a stop and then started persecuting the Jewish people. And uh, uh, we have this detailed study again in the Daniel series. I'm not going to repeat everything. I want to show you this map. Uh, when we talked about the Rome, usually people will look at this orange color uh, part only. That's where they get everything wrong. So Roman Empire, when you look at it, they have two legs. Remember even the Daniel's vision, the Nebuchadnezzar's vision, they have two legs. So in the two legs, we have the Eastern Empire and also the Western Empire. It is all, the whole thing is the Roman Empire. So when we say the Antichrist, the prince who is to come, comes from the Roman Empire, you have to include both the East and the West. You have to include both the legs. You can't just take one leg and then say the Antichrist will come from this one particular leg. No, you can't say that. So that is why this particular slide is very important for you to understand and uh, for the understanding of who the Antichrist is. So Antichrist will come from the Roman Empire that I agree. So this is the Roman Empire. But what I am trying to say here is you need to include both the Eastern leg and the Western leg. And for that matter, Eastern leg lasted longer, thousand years longer than the Western. So you have to consider the Eastern leg when we talk about the Roman Empire. And Antichrist, the prince who is to come, could come from any of these areas. So if you are wondering what that looks like uh, now, this is from the Google Maps. So this is what the current maps looks like. You see Turkey, you see Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Libya, and the, especially these are the 
when we talk about the beast coming out of the sea so remember mediterranean sea this is what we are all looking at even the previous previous map is all surrounded by this mediterranean sea so when we talk about the bible studies here especially the beast coming out of the sea and all this it is talking about the mediterranean sea and we are focusing on the countries surrounding this mediterranean sea especially israel the focus of the bible is written centered around israel if you keep that in mind i think everything will be right everything is centered around israel and uh, the sea that we are talking about is the mediterranean sea and the, the, the countries surrounding the mediterranean sea so even in this map i showed you earlier so look at the mediterranean sea and all this roman empire is coded color coded here uh, with the western and eastern it's all surrounding the mediterranean sea so that is the point that uh, we need to uh, keep in mind now when i talked about the signature so we are trying to find out some key uh, pieces to keep on to put the puzzle together one of the pieces of the puzzle that i want to show you is in daniel chapter 11 verse 36 to 39 it says then the king shall do according to his own will the king we are talking about is the prince that we studied earlier in the daniel chapter that is referring to antichrist so in other words we can say the antichrist shall do according to his own will he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god Uh, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished so when he started doing all this in during the seven year period he will prosper that is why he is going to go after the jews he is going to do all kinds of things but he is going to prosper until the wrath has been accomplished but that happens at the end of the seven year period so for until that time during that time he ha- he is going to prosper and he is going to do all kinds of stuff so here what is he doing he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god he shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods in other words he is a big mouth he is going to say all kinds of things against the god of gods and against the, the heavens in verse 37 he shall regard neither the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall exalt himself above them all so one of the signatures in this passage is of course he is going to disregard god and blaspheme god and all that but one other puzzle that we are going to look at here is he is going to disregard women so this guy antichrist guy he doesn't care about women and doesn't care about women's rights and that is the one uh, uh, puzzle that we are going to uh, get from this passage here and the second puzzle we are going to look at is in revelation chapter 20 verse 4 and i saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them and then i saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to jesus and for the word of god this is towards the end of the book revelation 20 we are studying now here in this verse so what this is saying is there john saw then i saw the souls of those who has been beheaded why are they beheaded for their witness to jesus and for the word of god so there will be faithful people even during the time of tribulation there will be gentiles there will be jews some they will be turning to christ they accept jesus as their savior and when they started witnessing what happens they will be beheaded so those souls john the john says here john while writing here in chapter 20 verse 4 then i saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to jesus and for the word of god who had not worshiped the beast or his image the key requirement if we want to survive during the time of tribulation especially the second part is you have to worship the beast or his image and have to receive a mark on their foreheads or on, or on their hands so this is a key requirement if anybody want to survive if you are not going to worship the beast if you are not going to worship his image if you are not going to get the mark on your foreheads or on your hands you will be beheaded so here it is clearly it's saying then he saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness so the point i'm trying to make is antichrist with all his armies and with all the modern weaponry he could have killed them with the ak47 rifles or some other way but why is he beheading 
this is the signature i am trying to, under, to underline this is the mode of antichrist how he is going to do because john specifically wrote it as beheading john could have said then i saw the souls of those who have been killed for their witnesses which would have been perfect but john did not say killed but he said beheaded so that means the beheading is the signature i am trying to so one disregard of women and then here the second one we are looking at is the beheadings i want to show you who is actually trying to go for the beheadings so here you see a banner behead those who insult islam and uh, the title of this newspaper says the pakistani minister calls for beheading of those who blaspheme muhammad so islam is trying to do some of this uh, key signatures that we are trying to identify and behead those who insult islam and then here you see another one behead the man who insult our prophet muhammad and our religion these are very common if you go to any of these uh, islamic nations you will find these kind of uh, beheadings and behead about beheading uh, things and also this is most of you as uh, remember this what happened during the isis beheading christians in libya and uh, the play around places around that area when they were uh, controlling those areas so the signature is beheading so isis beheading christians in this picture here and then here one imam tahidi writes the corrupt ideology of terrorism has existed since the early days of islam and it was simply revived in our time isis and its crimes can be explained in one honest sentence this is an imam writing this particular details the culture of the beheading opponent did not begin with isis it began with our early islamic caliphs those who disbelieve and repel from the path of allah he nullifies their works when you encounter those who disbelieve strike at their necks quran surah 47 verses 1 and 4 this is from quran quran says when you encounter those who disbelieve strike at their necks so this is what quran says and here we have a, a imam giving the details it started even with early islamic caliphs not just with isis itself that's the point is saying that actually i did a lot of research on this and this is one of my thesis and my uh, dissertation in my uh, doctoral studies if you i don't have time to give you all the details but if you are interested you can just go to google and say john ready persecution that will take you to the second link you can look at the second link basically here or even the first link is a video but the second link is the one i am pointing out so that will give you the whole uh, dissertation that's what i wrote about this particular topic so i just, since i don't have time i'm just giving you the resources where i'm coming from this was done with greater research and all that so you can just type uh, google john ready persecution in google and you can get the uh, scholarly link to that where um, my resources were given okay so what's the another signature so the other signature is actually in the bible itself in first john chapter 2 verse 22 to 23 and here it says who is a liar but he who denies that jesus is the christ he is antichrist who denies the father and the son john writing this clearly describing who is an antichrist and he says the antichrist is the one who denies the father and the son do you see that so antichrist is the one who denies the father and the son verse 23 whoever denies the son does not have the father either he who acknowledges the son has the father also so this is a very important verse because i'm um, the one of the key signatures i'm going to show you this is this is one of the major things is he is going to deny the antichrist is going to deny the father and the son he is the antichrist so in greek it is antichristos so it is so it can be interpreted as uh, um, opposite opposition to christ and also in place of christ so antichrist is basically in place of christ or in opposition to christ so here in john chapter 4 verse 1 it says beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of god 
because many false prophets have gone out into the world by this you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses that jesus christ has come in the flesh is of god so why is he writing john 2000 years ago because he knows that the antichrist is going to come and he is going to deny the father and the son and here he says by this you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses that jesus christ has come in the flesh is of god in verse 3 and every spirit that does not confess that jesus christ has come in the flesh is not of god do you see that every spirit that does not confess that jesus christ has come in the flesh is not of god and this is the spirit of antichrist you need to understand there are two things so the one thing is the spirit of antichrist and the other one is the antichrist himself the spirit of antichrist is already at work so if you read the rest of the verse he says which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world so the spirit of antichrist is already in the world so the spirit of antichrist is already rejecting that jesus christ has not come in the flesh that jesus christ is not the son of god so that kind of a spirit is already there that is the spirit of antichrist but antichrist the person antichrist is going to come in the future but here john makes it clear the spirit of antichrist is already at work islam unequivocally denies the father and the son quran surah 4 171 1935 you can read those details in quran uh, islam denies the father and the son so we just read a uh, study from uh, john whoever denies the father and the son or the antichrist and in quran here we see islam denies the father and the son so very clear signature very identifying who that antichrist will be and let's look at another signature here when we study the the uh, the book of revelation we need to put all these clues together otherwise we'll be just completely going in the wrong direction that is what the point i'm trying to make here to connect all these dots together in revelation 18 or 16 it says and alas alas that great city that was clothed in fine linen purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour such a great riches came to nothing every shipmaster and who travel by ships so sailors and many as trade on the sea stood at a distance this is about we are going to study in detail when we get to chapter 18 but the point i'm trying to show you is in verse 19 and let's continue from 18 and cried out when they saw the smoke of of her burning saying what is like this great city they threw dust on their heads and cried out weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she is made desolate so the point i'm trying to highlight here is here when the city was in calamity was burning the people were throwing dust on their heads and crying do you see that kind of a thing in new york or chicago or maybe in london do you see that no this is specific to middle east so that is my point so this is very specific to the middle eastern uh, culture so that is what i want to show you and here is a picture so people throwing dust on their heads when they cry so you can read about this kind of a description in the bible as well even king david threw dust on his head when his son absalom died so this is very specific to the middle east so the 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 signatures the the points that i'm trying to connect is all pointing to the middle east and that is what i wanted to show you here so it eliminates all all other things europe it eliminates the us and all other countries so that is what i'm trying to see with all these signatures we are trying to find now we are we keep talking about one world religion so now everybody wanted to bring all these religions together so that they can live in peace and that is what the ultimate goal is one world religion so in a bit by bit we are seeing that is happening right in front of our eyes so let's look at here pope kissing quran so quran is the holy book of for islam and here pope john paul is kissing the quran and so and then if you look at this here uh, pope prays at blue istanbul mosque so the point here is the pope goes to this mosque and he prays 
towards makkah so the, he is trying to be uh, friendly with them so the you know to make a one world religion you need to join hands right so here pope prays at blue istanbul mosque but uh, uh, when he is trying to make a one world religion and when he is trying to be friendly with the other religious groups i wonder how or if the other religion would uh, do the same favor for him so they won't come and pray to jesus christ they won't pray because it is blasphemous for them but why would pope do that so the point i'm trying to make is in the end islam is going to dominate and here right now we are already seeing that the, the pope is already um uh, joining hands with them you know like kissing qurans praying with uh, uh, islamic people in a mosque and all that we are seeing here many things people believe to be true or not mentioned in the bible like the word trinity yet christians believe based on the clear concepts revealed in the scriptures similarly one cannot disregard the inferences to islam because islam is not mentioned in its proper terms so that is my point so when i keep saying something about islam and all that so you may wonder why are you saying islam which is not mentioned in the bible but my point is the word trinity is also not mentioned but we know clearly the trinity is the concept is there so similarly when we connect all these dots the signatures we are calling it in this class when we put all the signatures together and all the puzzles all the clues and we can clearly see the inferences to islam you know in the bible John writes what he saw about the rider on the white horse who has a bow and a crown was given to him he went on conquering and to conquer a reliable transmitter of hadith claims quoting the christian scriptures the rider on the white horse in revelation 62 as mahdi you see the point in when we studied revelation 62 we said the rider on the white horse is the antichrist but here in hadith in islamic literature they are calling that same antichrist as their mahdi that is the their savior the, the characters were switched in islam that is what the point i'm trying to make so let me repeat this this is very important the antichrist in the bible in revelation 62 for them he is the mahdi that's the, he is the savior so that is the key difference. and they they even quote the christian scriptures a reliable transmitter of hadith claims quoting the christian scriptures the rider on the white horse in revelation 62 as mahdi so the majority of the christian scholars believe the rider on the white horse in revelation 62 identifies as the antichrist the biblical antichrist is the savior mahdi of islam do you get that so everything is turning around so that is the reason why in the end when they are going to fight against jesus christ because they think that he is the their antichrist so the big following will follow and fight against jesus christ following antichrist and now here in revelation 6 8 the apostle john writes so i looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was what death so the pale horse represents death and hades followed with him so i explained this when we studied revelation chapter 6 the pale actually meaning uh, the word is chloros so chloros is not actually it is a green so you know you can read the other word the word chloros is translated as green elsewhere in the bible for instance mark chapter 6 39 reads then he commanded that is jesus commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on on the green grass the same word chloros so but when they trans- translated this 6 8 they changed it to pale ho- pale horse but it uh, is supposed to be a green horse that is my point so it is actually a green horse not a pale horse a better translation of revelation 6 8 should have read green horse so what does the green horse represents the color green the color green is highly revered in islam in islam the green is very famous very popular muslims are promised to be robed with green clothes in the in paradise so here is a quran verse quran 76 21 upon them are garments of green silk and satin You know Jesus promises of white robes and here 
Quran promises them upon them are the garments of green silk. You get that? So that's why the green is very uh, popular and that's why here the chloros should have translated into green. And here also uh, there are some other clues I'm trying to quickly give you a lot of details here. So the flag of Pakistan is as you can see it's a green and also with a uh, crescent moon. So it's interesting the crescent moon also come up there. And now so the woman riding the beast is very critical in interpreting the book of Revelation. So where is this woman? We are going to study this towards the end of the book of Revelation. So there is going to be a woman. We are going to identify that. The woman is the central figure in these two important chapters, a major player in the drama of the last days. John gives far more attention to her than the beast she rides. So you have the woman which, is, which represents a false religion and you have the beast that she rides. And the fact that she rides the beast, a beast of such importance that it literally holds the central position in the Bible prophecy demands our special attention. So why is it so confusing? Why is this particular uh, details are so confusing is if you look at Islam, they don't have a political and a religious separate uh, uh, entities. Everything is one. So, you know, so they have the, the especially if you look at a Sharia law, so they basically combine the political and the religious. That's why even when we study these scriptures, it makes more confusing because it's switching the terms because of that particular reason, I believe. However, one interprets the woman's identity. It is clear that she represents the false religion of the last days. This false religion has control of the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and tongues. So do you see that? So the beast coming out of the sea is from the peoples, the multitudes and nations and tongues. And this false religion has control of the peoples, the multitudes and nations and tongues. She is seen as perpetuating and promoting a world religion that engulfs the world political system. So the religious system is also promoting a political system and they are intertwined. So that is that makes it even compl more complicated because the woman riding the beast, the false religion and the political system are married together. So the woman riding on the beast is very compelling to see numerous connections this false religion described here has in common with Islam. This false religion is both a religious system and a political system like Islam with its uh, Sharia law. So the places where you have the Sharia law, so it's both basically both, both the religious system and also the political system. So that is why it is very complex even for us to understand this particular chapters because this is what he is describing. It is not a separate one. The false religion is both a religious system and a political system. So that's why John sometimes calls the beast. Sometimes he also calls with the, the, the woman sitting on the beast, the rider on the beast. So because the false religion is both a religious system and a political system. So if he switches the names, that is the reason. So the false religion is both a religious system and a political system like Islam with its Sharia law. Again, a few uh, minute details here. The pan-Arab colors are black, white, green and red. You remember the four horses, the four horses colors, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse and the green horse remembered in what we studied in chapter 6. So the pan-Arab colors are black, white, green and red. Individually, each of these four pan-Arab colors were intended to represent a certain Arab dynasty. So these four colors again pointing to pan-Arab colors. So not only that, just look at these flags, the flags of the Islamic countries. So just a sample of the Islamic countries represented here, Jordan, Sudan, UAE, Palestine, Kuwait, Libya, Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq. So all of these colors, uh, the, the white, red, green and black. So all these colors are very uh, compelling to show all these colors are representing Islamic countries. Okay, I don't make much of that except to show, point out that there is one clue there. But the seven heads, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is and the other 
has yet to come and when he comes he must continue a short time the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition this verse itself will take a couple of days for us to unpack <laughs> see it is loaded if you read, if, I, if i just read this what is going on he says five fallen and then he says seven and then also eight and what what is going on so that is what we are going to study so the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits so woman is what woman is the false religion keep that in mind the woman is the false religion the seven heads and are the seven mountains the mountains represents what kingdoms okay so now with that understanding let's look at the next slide so the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings you, uh, who has received no kingdom as yet but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast so i am trying to again bring some verses from chapter 17 and other places to connect the dots so because the 10 horns which you saw here or 10 kings we studied this particular chart before when we studied the book of daniel there are four beasts the lion the bear the leopard and the exceedingly dreadful terrible beast that is rome so you have the babylon the medo persia and greece and also you have rome the, so from when daniel was writing he started with where he was Daniel was in Babylonian court so he started with the lion so what are the seven worlds that it's talking about here or the seven heads so the first one is the Egypt again we are only focused on the Mediterranean sea keep that in mind yeah, when we talk about the Mediterranean sea and the empires surrounding that then this is what we will get so the Egypt Assyria the second one is Assyria uh, the Babylon the Medo Persia Greece Rome and then we are going to study the the other uh, empires that are going to come but when john is writing in what empire he was in he was in rome he was in roman domination jesus christ was also crucified during the uh, rome under pontius pilate and john was also uh, there during rome so for john to look back how many empires were there before greece medo persia Babylon, Assyria and Egypt five so that's why he says five have fallen that's it when John writes it clearly he says five have fallen and he says one is what is that one is that's Rome and then he talks about the other things that's going to come so but we are going to study that in the next slide so here is a breakdown so seven heads he talks about the seven heads represents seven mountains and also it represents the same seven kingdoms when we talk about a mountain having a king it means a kingdom uh, and then 10 horns 10 horns represents 10 kings five kingdoms fallen he says five kingdoms fallen what are those five egypt assyria babylon medo persia greece and he says one is that is for john this is the current one he is in rome when he is writing he was in rome so if i have fallen so that's the and then after that came another empire which john didn't even know he just said there will be something else so the seventh empire is the ottoman empire so if you look at the rome the byzantine empire the eastern leg which lasted like 1400 years what happened after that so the turks of the ottoman empire took over and they were ruling all this so the ottoman empire around the mediterranean sea was dominated by the ottoman empire so after rome the ottoman empire and then after that what happened everything fall apart so now antichrist is the eighth so now you read this very carefully also the eighth and is of the seventh see that interesting thing in so it says he is of the eighth he is also the eighth but he is of the seventh so the ottoman empire whatever the ottoman empire configuration was that is going to be the last empire that is the antichrist empire so that is what it is so the antichrist empire will be like that of the seventh which is the ottoman empire does that make sense so we have now listed out all these eight five have fallen one is that is rome and then the other two is going to come that is the ottoman empire the seventh one and but only for mentioning the antichrist that's the eighth one antichrist empire is eighth 
and it says also the eighth and is of the seventh. It's interesting. It says that. So that means the Antichrist empire is like that of the seventh. So here is just a glimpse to show you what the Assyrian empire looked like. Of course, you know the Egypt because a lot of that was mentioned in the Bible. And also there were some references to the Assyrian empire. This is again the, around the Mediterranean Sea. That is why we are, our focus is on that. And then we have the Ottoman Empire. So again, surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, these are all the nations or the countries around this Mediterranean Sea, around the Ottoman Empire. Daniel chapter 7 verse 19, it says, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with his feet. And the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell namely that horn had uh, eyes and a mouth which speaks pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows so wherever you see this guy the, with the horn with had eyes and had mouth, mouth with uh, pompous words speaking pompous words that's talking about the antichrist so even daniel in chapter 7 we see that he makes a reference to that and then in, he continues in verse 21, I was watching and the same, that is the little horn, was making war against the saints. So the Antichrist is going to persecute the believers. That's what it means. So he's going to make a war against the saints and prevailing against them. That means he's going to kill them. He is going to prevail against them, meaning he's going to kill them or beheading them. That's what we studied earlier. Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in the favor of the saints of the Most High. So God is going to come in the second coming. He's going to judge the nations. Until that point, this guy is going to kill people. He's going to behead the people, especially the believers. That's what this is all about. And also Daniel makes a detailed description about how this is all going to unfold. In verse 23 of chapter 7, he says, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the others, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. The ten horns are the ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. So when we look at these passages and when we study from Daniel towards Revelation, there is a progression made. So Daniel was not given more details. When John comes to the, the, the right the Revelation, he started introducing additional details. That is how we have to read this. Because it is a, progress, a progressive revelation. So that is why John was saying that it was an 8th empire. So because Daniel didn't mention about the 8th empire at all. But when it comes to John, he's going to introduce that. So the additional details were added as you continue to study the book of Revelation when uh, compared with the Daniel um, uh, details. Again in uh, Daniel chapter 7, 25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints, and uh, for how long? He is going to be for a time and a times and a half a time. What is he going to do? He shall persecute the saints and shall intend to change times and law. This is another clue. Of course, I didn't highlight it as a clue. He is going to change the times and the law. So in Sharia law, they are going to do everything on a different day and their laws are different. So basically what they are going to do is they are going to change times. That means the calendars will be changed to Sharia law. And also their laws will be implemented and forced the Sharia law. So here it clearly says, and the Antichrist, and the Antichrist shall intend to change times and laws. That's what it means. And this is for three and a half years. And then I want to show you another one. The Kaaba stone marked the location where the sacred world intersected with the profane. The embedded black stone was a further symbol of this as a meteoroid that had fallen from the sky and linked heaven and earth. So when you look at the one of the, uh, the pillars of Islam, they, they really put this uh, pilgrimage to Mecca as a one key pillar. So what are they going to do in Mecca? That's there. They have the Kaaba stone. The Kaaba is a mosque and on one corner of this sacred building is a corner stone known as the black stone. Its history is shrouded in mystery and there is such a speculation over what that stone might be. Many Muslims believe the stone is in fact a meteoroid 
possessing supernatural powers so they thought it right has fallen from the sky so they thought it is very uh, important for them and they are, they put that in this kaaba stone and they actually go and um, um, kind of a worship that of course they say they are not worshiping the stone but that's what you see them doing and also if you look at the similar thing happening in acts chapter 19 some therefore cried one thing and some other uh, another for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know what they had come together and they drew alexander out of the multitude the jews putting him forward and alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people but when they found out that he was a jew all with one voice cried out for about 2 hours what are they crying great is diana of ephesus so in acts also there is a similar situation where they were praising and crying out and uh, praising this great diana of ephesus and what is this ephesus diana basically if you look at the next words it says uh, and when the city clerk had quieted the crowd he said men of ephesus what man is there who does not know the city of ephesus is the temple guardian of the great goddess diana and of the image which fell from fell down from zeus that is Ju- jupiter so you see even in acts they were worshiping this meteorite that fell from sky or from, from you know so they were worshiping this thing and that is exactly what now we are tra- trying to do, they are trying to do even in islam so of course so satan will change names such so as satan will tra- change all this labels but behind the scenes it is all the same same old story so worshiping the the, um, uh, the thing the stone that the fell from the sky that's what they believe so here is a kaaba stone um, so you see uh, people they make a pilgrimage to this place to worship this uh, place uh, and this is one of the pillars of islam as they have to make a pilgrimage to mecca and this is the kaaba stone and on one corner is that stone now it is it, it seems it is broken into pieces now they have to put that in a frame or something so and then the pilgrims go and touch that kiss that and they do all kinds of weird things with that you can see the pictures it's not just i am saying it but you can find those details out and here is the the people um, um basically going in droves trying to uh, visit this kaaba and here is another picture of that same stone um, the kaaba stone and this is the corner on this side of it you see that they put that frame and the small the, the stone was uh, embedded into that uh, corner of that wall so the beast from the sea and i saw one of its heads as if it had been mortally wounded and ha- and has a and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast So you remember all these heads were the kingdoms and now here it says one of his heads were mortally wounded if you look at the ottoman empire it was mortally wounded it just basically it kind of a disappeared at now when it is going to come back islamic caliphate in its new form the ottoman empire everybody is going to be marveled and followed the beast so that is what the point is so let's read this again and i saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast so when this revived islamic caliphate comes to power so everybody is going to follow that they will be worshiping um, this islamic caliphate in verse 4 so they worshiped the dragon dragon represents what satan remember keep keep that so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like the beast who is able to make war with him so here satan gives the authority to the beast that is the antichrist and uh, they were worshiping and praising because this beast also you know represents the revived uh, islamic empire out of which comes this antichrist guy and in verse 5 and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months we are now studying the beast from the sea and the beast from the sea was given a mouth with speaking blasphemous things we just studied that in the book of daniel i showed you some, some few verses he speaks pompous words and things like that again they are identified as antichrist and here 
we are reading again the same details that is how i am connecting all these dots the beast from the sea is the antichrist and he was given he to look at this he was given a mouth that means a permission was given for him to speak whatever he want to speak and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given an authority to continue for 42 months that is 3 and 1/2 years so for 3 and 1/2 years he is going to blaspheme he is going to persecute the believers and we see this in revelation 13:5 Revelation 13:5 says that the beast who represents the same individual described in this chapter will have power for 42 months which is equal to 3 and 3 and 1 half years. Revelation 11:2 relates that Jerusalem will be trampled for 42 months which is the time of the persecution of the antichrist. All of these pieces are coming to um, uh, together if you put this uh, 42 months Jerusalem will be trampled antichrist will be speaking both um, blasphemous words for 42 months so all of these things are connected so the beast from the sea clearly is the antichrist thus the persecution of the saints will continue for 3 and 1/2 years which is exactly half of antichrist's 7 year career commonly this latter part of the antichrist rule is called the great tribulation so the king the future antichrist will do as he pleases he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place so we studied this earlier in daniel so he is going to do whatever he pleases and he is going to be prosperous uh, for that given period which is 42 months the second half of that uh, in his 7 year career this is a description of the future antichrist he will be authoritarian he will do as he pleases self exalting he will exalt and magnify himself for blasphemous he will speak monstrous things against the god of gods temporarily successful irreligious he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers opposed to christ and no regard for women and also the reference is uh, he is not going to tall even don't show any regard for the jewish women who was who was expecting messiah so it was kind of a dual fulfillment there daniel chapter 11 41 he will also invade the beautiful land many countries will fall but edom moab and the leaders of ammon will be delivered from his hand remember in the last chapter i told you that uh, uh, israel will run out Uh, from the persecution when the antichrist or the dragon um, uh, started chasing them so where did they go i showed you that they are going to petra jordan so here in another passage in daniel chapter 11 41 it says antichrist for some reason cannot invade these three countries so he will also invade the beautiful land that is israel many countries will fall all countries is going to occupy around that area but edom Moab and the leaders of Ammon that is Jordan will be delivered from his hand so these three will be delivered so it's for some reason these three countries will not get under his the grip of uh, the antichrist and that is one of the reasons i said israel will uh, flee to petra jordan where they will be protected so the, these three will be there uh, protected the ten horns i consider the ten horns and behold there came up among them another horn a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots and behold in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things you remember in daniel chapter 7 verse 8 when we studied in detail the three horns were plucked out and then the little horn will take over uh, that's the antichrist there in he will extend his power over many countries so the egypt will not escape he will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of egypt with the libyans and cushites in submission so the three the, the three horns is going to pluck we studied that earlier in detail so these are the three countries egypt libyans and cushites into submission so here is the map he is going to dominate the, he is going to uh, subdue these three countries and dominates and then he is going to take the uh, out of the 10 horns he is going to take three out so he will be the, actually the 11th horn taking three out and taking the dominance of uh, those all those 10 horns so for this 
please watch the Daniel series where I explained all these details in a greater detail. Here are some of the nations I mentioned. Um, so the Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and of course uh, the three other countries I already mentioned would be the part of those the, uh, 10, co 10 country confederacy. Um, this is the area you have to focus. Everything is in this area. So the three countries, the 10 horns, the 10 countries. So towards the end, this is all the focus is going to be in this circle. Because surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, all these countries are the uh, are the ones that uh, the focus would be. So during the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist will engage in a world war. He will also enter Israel, the beautiful land, ignoring some nations uh, that are in alliance with him, but conquering others, including Egypt, Libya, and Sudan. So then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So this is... In Revelation 13, in verse 6, we see the blasphemy that he is doing and we also studied the other places where he was doing the same thing. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue and nation. Pretty much he is going to control everybody around that area. So, you know, that is what it means. So, in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. If somebody was left behind, if somebody was not taken up in rapture, they have still the chance to go to heaven if they don't worship the beast. But if they worship the beast, their all chances are gone. There is no way that they can get to heaven. So that's what it means in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. At that time, he will force the worship of the dragon worship of the beast who and those who are the ones who are worshiping the beast are the ones whose names have not been written in the book of life if anyone has an ear let him hear does that sound very familiar we studied this too much or several times in chapter 2 and chapter 3 if you have an ear let him hear this the reason for this is this point is very important the point we just studied about the worship of the beast is very important because if you worship the beast you forfeit all your chances of getting into heaven. So that's what it means. So that's why uh, it says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Let me read this because it is so important. Let me read this verse again. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life. So if your name has to be written in the book of life, you will not worship. And if you are not going to worship, you will be beheaded. So that is so important. You, you should not worship. You should not take the mark of the beast. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. It's a warning. But one thing I want to focus here is when we studied chapter 2 and chapter 3, you remember this verse had an extension of it. What is that? If anyone has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now the churches part is missing because now church is already gone. You remember that the first chapter 2 and 3, it is all about the churches and every time it was mentioned, this is what we saw. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 2, 7, 2, 11, 2, 17, 2, 29, 3, 6, 3, 13 and 3, 22. All these references, it has the Spirit says to the churches. Now when we get to the middle of the book, after the rapture, we believe, so now there is no church here. So the mention is, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. So that the second part of that verse is now not there. The Spirit says to the churches, this is another reason why I strongly believe the rapture will happen before chapter 4, before tribulation. Verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. There will be captivity, there will be beheadings, there will be killings and all that. But what if you are if you want to continue to follow Christ, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. You have to continue in patience and with faith, no matter what happens to you. Because once you die, you'll if you, for your faith, you will be saved if you are not taking the mark of the beast. So that is so important. Thank you for watching. This is a tedious lesson. So the beast from the sea. We concluded the beast from the sea. Next week we are going to continue with the beast from the earth. I am going to repeat some of the things what are relevant for the next section. So with this we conclude chapter 
13 part 1 so there is going to be a part 2 for the beast from the earth next week thank you for watching if you have not subscribed yet please do subscribe to this channel and if you like these videos please like and also you can visit my blog dailydevotion.org again thank you for watching